BBC News, Richard Montgomery. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, has called for an independent investigation into the death of at least 16 Palestinians during Friday's clashes with Israeli soldiers along the border with Gaza. Members of the UN Security Council, meeting an emergency session in New York, condemned the violence. The UN Assistant Secretary General, Tayyip Baruch Zerihun, called for a resumption of peace efforts. The UN strongly urged Palestinians, Israelis and the international community to take concrete measures that would reverse the current course of the conflict and advance the goal of a just and sustainable peace based on the two-state solution. The Israeli army accuses the protesters of hurling stones and firebombs during the first day of demonstrations in support of the right of refugees to return to their homes in what is now Israel. The UN Security Council has imposed its largest ever package of penalties on companies accused of helping North Korea to evade international sanctions. Here's Lebo de Seco. The sanctions are on 27 ships, 21 shipping companies and a person. Uh, the shipping companies will now have their assets frozen. The ships themselves, some of them are North Korean, some of them are not. They will face a mix of measures, including global port bans, asset freezes, and also being deregistered. Uh, the man is a Taiwanese man. He's having his assets frozen, and he'll also be given a global travel ban, and that is for helping uh, to coordinate North Korean coal exports. An independent autopsy in the body of a young black American, Stefan Clark, who was shot dead by police in California 11 days ago, has found that seven of eight gunshot wounds were in the back or the side. The forensic pathologist, Bennett Omalu, said any of the gunshot wounds would have been fatal. The trajectories of all these wounds were forward and leftward. And each one of these bullets independently possess a fatal capacity, meaning that out of all these seven, all he needed to have died was just one of the seven. The Trump administration says it wants to begin collecting the social media history of most people applying for entry into the country. The proposal filed by the State Department would require U.S. visa applicants to provide details of Facebook, Twitter and other social media identities used in the past five years. The plan has been criticized by civil liberties groups as an invasion of privacy. BBC News. A federal court in Washington has issued an injunction to prevent the government denying undocumented immigrant teenagers access to abortions and related services. The U.S. state agency with responsibility for young unaccompanied migrants adopted a policy last year requiring refugee shelters to obtain permission from Director Scott Lloyd, an opponent of abortion, before helping those in their care to seek terminations. North Korean state media says its leader, Kim Jong-un, has thanked the president of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, for helping to bring about a thaw in inter-Korean relations. The two men spoke during a visit to Pyongyang by Mr. Bach to discuss North Korea's participation in future Olympic Games. The global shipping industry is facing growing demands to do more to reduce emissions to help tackle climate change. Roger Harabin reports. When governments meet each year to set climate targets, the shipping industry sails quietly by. Climate talks are on a national basis, but shipping is international, so it's managed to evade any cap on its carbon emissions. Now the industry is under pressure. A motion to the International Maritime Organization urges shipping to play its part in the Paris Agreement to stabilize the climate. But plans for an emissions cap are being resisted by a group of nations which says that could harm global trade and drive goods onto less efficient forms of transport. The EU has threatened that if the IMO fails to agree tough standards, it will impose its own rules on shipping emissions in European waters. Russia says British customs officers have searched an airliner from Moscow after it arrived at London's Heathrow Airport on Friday. It says the UK officials boarded the Aeroflot plane and tried to carry out the operation without the crew being present. After negotiations, the captain was allowed to remain. BBC News.
Welcome to The Real Story with me, Carrie Gracie. This week, we begin outside Facebook's shiny new headquarters in central London. It all looks serene behind the plate glass. But after 50 million Facebook users allegedly had their data mined and misused without their permission, politicians in the UK and the US have summoned Facebook bosses to answer questions, and billions have been wiped from the company's market value. In 2018, much of our internet is controlled by a handful of players. Facebook, Google, Amazon and Apple. They shape our shopping and our leisure. Will our work and our politics come next? Or are Facebook's bad headlines a wake-up call for citizens and the beginning of the end for the grip of the giants? That's our topic this week. Let's get over to the studio and meet the panel. And we're joined from Nairobi by Betange Demo of the University of Nairobi Business School, from New York City by Louise Matsakis, who's a writer for the technology website Wired, and here in the London studio, Rachel Caldercutt of Dot Everyone, which champions a fairer internet, and Jamie Bartlett, author of forthcoming book The People vs. Tech, How the Internet is Killing Democracy. It's also worth mentioning who we're not joined by today. We invited both Google and Facebook to take part in this program. They were not available, but welcome and thank you to everyone who joins me. My thoughts on reading up for this program, I was scared. Warnings that we're not just merging with our machines, but we're merging with the companies that operate those machines. But then I thought these companies wouldn't have billions of users if they weren't doing something useful for those users. So is it really time to panic? A couple of words from each of you. Jamie Bartlett. It is a good wake-up call, and I think it is time to, if not completely panic, uh, at least be aware, as I think a lot of people now are, of just the extent of how important and big these platform companies actually have become. So. While they do offer all sorts of fantastic services, and you're absolutely right, that's why we all use them and we're all semi-addicted to them, I think there's a realisation now that there is, there's something bigger going on, that there's these concentrations of power and influence that we've, we've only just started to really understand. Louise Matsakis. Yeah, I think that users and consumers really have to take this moment to examine what the trade-off is, because so many of these services are free or extremely discounted compared to what came before them. And I think that users are starting to realise that you are the product, and part of that trade-off is your data, it's your time, it's your attention, and that's what you are you know, trading in exchange for these great conveniences. And I think we have to really look at whether or not that is a bargain that is working out for us. Betangain game demo, don't panic, but wake up, realize the trade-off. I think we shouldn't panic, knowing what these platforms have done, especially towards democratization, giving more space for people to air their views, where governments used to ban people from talking. I think it's a wake-up call that we begin to look for solutions that would provide a better understanding how the, our data has been used. And Rachel Caldercott, you champion a fairer internet. What's your take right now? We've been talking to lots of people about their feelings about tech, and while maybe they haven't been panicking, there's a lot of worry, anxiety, People feel that technology is good for them as individuals and not for the world at large. And I think this is a good moment to turn that into a story that everyone's really able to understand. Well, let's hear now from someone who believes it is really time to wake up. Dylan Curran is an Irish data consultant. His investigation into his own relationship with big tech went viral this week with 85 million views. Dylan, thanks for joining us. What did you find? Hi guys, thanks for having me. So what I found mostly was that Facebook and Google were storing pretty much an unnecessary amount of data. So I understand the fact that they need to take data in order to target advertising correctly and make money as a company. The problem really was that they were taking way too much than could possibly be needed to target any advertising. So Facebook, well, they were storing all your messages and all that kind of stuff, which is fair enough but they're also storing your actual phone call records and your phone text messages and your phone contacts. So these are external to Facebook, but they're still storing them and recording them. Then Google were storing pretty much everything you do online, and they record it in a chronological way, and they do it constantly, so that every time you open your phone and do something, Google's lodging it, whether that be your location, 
your search history, your browsing history, the apps are opening and closing, the apps are viewing and clicking, your YouTube history, etc. They store everything and keep it pretty much forever. And you're a professional, Dylan. I mean, you're a data consultant. Couldn't you have done more yourself to manage your privacy settings? So what Google and Facebook basically do is they have a variety of privacy settings. So for instance, Facebook had a privacy menu with 16 sub-menus. So you'd have to go in and turn off, you know, maybe 50 different settings because they're all, they have so many configurations and the same thing happens with Google. And it's your account, it's your password, surely it's safe and the info is at the end of the day useful to you. What's the problem? So the information is very useful for Google to target advertising and make their services better. What is mostly of concern is that these corporations are essentially monopolies in their fields. For instance, 70% of internet users use Google services. So that's approximately 2.2 billion people. And Google also store, on average, one gigabyte of data per person that uses their services. So then if you calculate that, they have around 2.2 billion gigabytes of data on people. I think it would be alarming in the future if the world were to change in such a way where that information could be used for malicious purposes, then that would be a very bad thing indeed. And what can you do then as a user to prevent that? I think you try to delete some of this material. Yeah, so I'd actually gone in and deleted multiple things. Like I've cleared my search and browsing history, I've deleted some files from my Google Drive, which is a cloud storage service. I've gone in and deleted certain apps, etc. And I found that they were still keeping all of the data. And then I also found that if you're using Google Incognito, which is a private browsing service, you are under the impression that none of your data has been collected. However, they do still keep the information. It's just that the information is not kept locally. You say like your wife would be able to see what you're looking at, but then Google could. And is there a problem with Google being able to do that? You, you mentioned a, a kind of potential malicious actor. What do you imagine that malicious actor doing? What would their motive be? And how would they get access? I mean, it's your account, you've got the password. I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist or a tinfoil hat and just say, you know, like, Google is going to control the world. I don't think that's what's happening. I think they're actually a great company. My problem really is that we don't know what the future holds. Four years ago, we, we, we never would have said Donald Trump would be president, and now he is. So we have no idea what's in the future, and a company with this kind of information is a potential danger to everyone. Dylan Curran, thanks so much for joining us. I want to ask the panel how they feel about uh, that. Is this kind of information a danger to everyone? Bitang uh, demo. Yes, it is a, a danger, but what I say, if you look at where the opportunities arise from, is from out of problems. Now we know the problems we can begin to use technology to deal with this. Bitangi, we'll deal with the future in a moment, but how about you? Do you sleepwalk through the privacy issues? Do you know how your data is being used? Are you shocked by the stories we've read over recent weeks? Yes, I'm shocked, but it is very difficult to stop using it because we are so much attached to it. And uh, sometimes you can trade your privacy for the conveniences that you are getting, but sometimes you don't know to what extent they are going to misuse your data. Luis Matsakis. Yeah, I mean, I think we've already seen the consequences of what this data can do. I mean, numerous tech companies have handed over user data to authoritarian regimes. That's already happened. You've already seen situations where, you know, Google Maps has shaped borders and shaped how people understand the map of the world and political conflicts through what they see on Google Maps. We've already seen how this data can change and shape our world. And I think that there already have been negative consequences of it. I don't think there needs to be a hypothetical bad actor in the future. I think we've already seen you know, one or two or three companies having the vast majority of data on users in the world already has negative consequences. And for you, is that use of data and the enormous capacity for storing and manipulating data. Is that the biggest problem with the current internet? It's a consequence and it's a symptom of the fact that such a narrow group of companies have a monopoly over the vast majority of the way we behave online. And I think that's really the problem is that these companies have grown so large and that's why they've been able to suck up so much of this data. What people need to think about is that they're not just companies. They are larger than nation states. They have more users than any country in the history of the world. And I think that they behave 
like nation states, not just like corporations. And I think we need to almost come up with like a new terminology to understand their behavior. Jane Bartlett, how did we get then to this winner-takes-all world where such a vast and vital market is dominated by so few giants? Well, I think there's something almost inherent in digital technology that leads to that. You could say that a lot of industries tend towards monopolies where big companies, you know, they build up certain economies of scale and so on. But in digital technology, I think it's even more so. I mean, Facebook grew because every time a new person joined Facebook, it made Facebook slightly better, which meant more people would join, which in turn meant more people would join still. And you've seen the same happening for search engines and for um, taxi apps and all these other big tech platforms, essentially, which is why these enormous oligopolies or monopolies seem to turn up overnight. And of course, it's very easy for these companies to scale up. I mean, Airbnb can grow much quicker than an ordinary hotel company can because they don't have to build the things themselves. So a lot of people in the early 90s thought that this digital technology was going to mean we'd have a really healthy long tail of competitive companies all competing with each other. And of course, that really hasn't been the case. And that's why I wasn't surprised at all when Dylan talked about all the data that had been collected on him. But because when you're working in advertising, and a lot of these companies are essentially advertising firms now, you kind of want to collect everything because you don't quite know what's going to be useful and you don't know what's going to correlate with what. So this is going to get, by the way, far worse because we are about to start creating way more data about ourselves than we have in the last decade. It's really important that we... Remember, this is not just about uh, monopolies either. This is a type of economy which is often trading on people's attention. And there is this great incentive for these companies to always be alert.